So this is an interview for the Purdue University's Oral History Program. Today's date is March 7th, 2018. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration here at the Purdue Archives. Today I am interviewing Mr. Robert F. Wells. Mr. Wells is an engineering graduate of Purdue University. He graduated in 1950 with a Bachelor's of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics. Mr. Wells, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and for participating in our oral history program. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to start um, by asking you about your early years and your education. So could you tell us um, where you were born and where you grew up and a, just a little bit about what it was like? Yes, I can do that. Uh, I was born in Clinton, Missouri, November 29th, 1926. Uh, I did not go to school there. We, our family moved to Des Moines, Iowa when I was three years old. I started school in Des Moines, and uh, I continued there through 10th grade, through elementary school, junior high, and first year of high school. And then, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, my interest in aeronautics started very early. Uh, my father liked to go to the airport and see the activity there, and I can remember doing that when I was maybe three or four, well, probably four years old, wow. and getting very interested, even at that age, in, in aircraft. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a goal of mine from a very early time. Then, uh, when I was about 12, I was having a conversation with my brother, who is uh, about three years older than I. He asked me what I was going to do when I grow up. And I said, oh, I want to work on airplanes. And I, and I meant that literally. I would had it, at that time, I was planning on being an aircraft mechanic. Mm -hmm. And my brother said, oh, you mean you want to be an aeronautical engineer? And I thought, oh, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> he is the one that steered me in that direction. Wow, thank goodness. <laughs> well, from then on, that was my goal. And I, I took every science and math class available mm -hmm. all through high school. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, because my of death of my father when I was 15, we moved to Springfield, Missouri. Uh, my mother and I moved in with her parents, and I finished high school there in Springfield. Mm -hmm. did, so that's the early part of my education. Did I read that you took flying lessons. Did you take flying lessons as a te yes. teenager? Yes. Uh, when I moved to Springfield... I was hanging out at the airport every chance I could, <laughs> and uh, I was 15 at the time, and I got a job working at the airport just uh, helping out with taking care of the airplanes and putting them away at night and things like that, and <clears throat> discovered I could, what little pay I was making, I could use for flying lessons. So I started taking flying lessons, and I soloed when I was 15 years old. Hmm. And I don't think my mother even knew I was doing that. But <laughs> I would ride. In, I couldn't didn't have a driver's license, but I'd ride my bicycle out to the airport. And if I get a few dollars together, I'd rent an airplane and go flying. Oh my goodness! <laughs> she didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, that was. Then uh, World War II came along, and uh, I wasn't out of high school yet, but I had enough credits to graduate, and I was decided that if I started college, I would probably have to go into the military right away, so I, I delayed that. 
You delayed it? De delayed it. I didn't, uh -huh. go, I didn't go to college as soon as I could have. I see. Uh -huh. I waited uh, a few months. And I was called active duty. I had in, enlisted in the Army Air Force, and I was in the Air Force Reserve. And it's right after my 18th birthday, they put me on active duty. Mm -hmm. But, and I went through all the testing for pilot training, uh, which was pretty easy since I was already flying. Right. And I actually had orders to go to flight school, and they anticipated they were going to have more pilots than they needed, so they canceled the pilot program. Hmm. And I finished up training as a teletype mechanic. <laughs> hmm. But uh, as soon as the war ended, I was released mm -hmm. very shortly and uh, got into college as quickly as I could. What, why did you choose Purdue? Well, that's a little interesting, too. Uh, I've been looking at other schools uh, that had uh, aeronautical department. Uh, Iowa State had one, Oklahoma had one, I think Illinois had one. When I came home from the Army, talking to my mother about this, and she said, well, let me make another comment first. My mother was an excellent housekeeper and mother and many other things, but I didn't think of her as a very really sophisticated technical person. Mm -hmm. But she said uh, to me, I've been talking to the young men around town and they tell me the best engineering schools are MIT, Caltech, and Purdue. <laughs> Right. And your brother, well, Caltech and MIT are private schools. She's, she's still speaking to me. MIT and Caltech are private schools. Purdue is a public school. And your brother is in medical school at the University of Indiana. So I think you should go to Purdue. And I said, okay, Mom. <laughs> That's, that's literally how I picked Purdue. <laughs> well, she was right, huh? <laughs> she was right. <laughs> Great. So, um, what, what was it like to be a student at Purdue? And then maybe you could talk a little bit about the Aero Modelers Club as well. Okay. Uh, first of all, I was part of what was called the GI class. Uh, I actually arrived at campus in January of 47, and the entire class that year were returning GIs. Wow. Everybody in that class had been in the military. In fact, most of us were still in uniform because they were the only clothes we had. Wow. We're so uh, I had made arrangements to live in a dormitory. That would be fantastic. Uh, I was up on a balcony. It's a, actually a pretty good photograph of how it was done. We, we all had double deck bunks shoved together in group to four and a little portable thing to hang our clothes in, and that was it. Wow. <laughs> so uh, we stayed there for a whole semester. Oh, my goodness. It must 
must have been so noisy. Well, Although were, you probably... they were all students, so they were pretty quiet. Yeah. Uh, I used to take a shower at midnight because that's the only time I could get in. Right. <laughs> but I would go to the library to do any study mm -hmm. I needed to do. So. Mm -hmm. We made it work. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure. So, uh, that was the class I was with through the whole four years. And, uh, the, those guys were tough competition. They were serious about school. Mm -hmm. There was no fooling around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, maybe there was, but not much. Right, the curriculum was tough. Oh, I said the curriculum was probably pretty tough. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how it started with me. And then, I guess very early, I heard about this model airplane club. I had done some model airplane work for several years before that. And I heard about this club. So I tracked it down. And uh, as I started to say earlier, it was in the basement of the student union building. They had a space there that was assigned to us. And uh, fairly large space, and we had workbenches, and we had uh, some lockers that we could put things in and lock them up. We had uh, keys to the door so we could lock the whole room up. That's where we were the whole four years that I was there. And I, I saw a comment somewhere that it might have been moved out to the airport later. Mm -hmm. And that picture I sent you of Neil and I standing outside with airplanes sitting on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So that was... That, that was right outside the student room of building. Oh, and that was Neil Armstrong, right? Yeah. And yeah, that's a wonderful photograph <laughs> with your boxes, the box and the uh, airplanes. Yeah. What were the boxes? Were those the uh, tools? We carried various tools and things that we needed. You know, if we had to change propellers, or we always had to carry uh, things to handle fuel with uh, and various accessories we needed. Mm hmm. So those model airplanes, you, you just said fuel, right? So they actually, how would they function? Well, one thing I want to say about this is, although it was a hobby, it was a lot more than that. It was part of our education because okay. we didn't go to a model shop and buy a kit and put it together. We, we designed our own airplanes, every bit of it. Mm -hmm. uh, various things like aerodynamics and engine design, propellers, uh, fuels. We were mixing our own fuels. We were making our own propellers. We were doing a lot of modifications to the engines. Mm -hmm. See, there's a lot of competition in model aviation. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine. <laughs> I remember going to one meet, uh, and there were different specialties. Uh, I was flying what's called speed U control, where you fly an airplane at the end of a, two wires that are about 60 feet long, and the whole idea is to maximize speed. So uh, we were flying around 150 miles an hour. Wow. I remember going to one meet, and we had t-shirts that said Purdue Aero Modelers on them. Oh, yeah. I've seen one picture of that. <laughs> and our logo was a, a slide rule with wings on it. <laughs> that, that was on our shirt. So I remember going to one meet, uh, 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 one of these U-Control meets, and I heard it, overheard somebody say, uh-oh, Purdue is here, and he packed up and left. 
<laughs> Poor sport. <laughs> So Purdue prepared you well for your career. What 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 do you think were the most important lessons that maybe you graduated with from Purdue? So that kind of leads me into one of my other questions, uh, which was, um, what was your first job after graduating Purdue, and 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 how did you end up? Was that in Wichita, did you say? That was in Wichita. Yeah. Did you mean... Well, there was quite a contrast between Boeing and Cessna and yeah. how they handled people. Yeah. So I went to work for Cessna after uh, being married and spending a couple of weeks on a honeymoon and finding a place to live and went to work. Did you meet your wife at Purdue? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what 
What did was she's what was she studying at Purdue? Kelly? Well, she wasn't at Purdue. Oh, oh, I thought you said she you was, I met her in Springfield. Oh, I see. Did you say on glass cloth? Yes, because it's very stable. It doesn't change with moisture or temperature. Oh. And they took those drawings and printed them directly onto metal and then cut the parts out of the metal. Hmm. We designed and built and flew an airplane in six weeks. Wow. What what um what aspects did you work on? What was what's your most memorable? I guess. Well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
strain levels? Uh -huh. On an entire airplane. And one of my jobs was to determine the uh, lateral deflection of the vertical stabilizer under load. So I designed the system to apply the loads. And that's going to use an optical instrument to measure the deflection. But uh, in order to do that, I had to put the instrument on top of the fuselage towards the tail at a target and then I climbed up there and was reading data from this incident while loads were being applied I kept hearing this little pinging sound and what the heck is that and I realized there were rivet heads popping off because of the loads <laughs> oh. <laughs> and uh, I broke the I broke the tail off of that airplane three times before they got it right. <laughs> well, better on the ground than up in the air, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why we did it. Yeah. And that was the first airplane to use much titanium for uh, mm -hmm. structural purposes. But we'll have fuselage and uh, tail were constructed of titanium. It must have been exciting work to know you were testing these new materials and sort of Yeah, I really like that kind of work. Uh, one reason is when you're assigned uh, a test, you're, you've got the whole thing. You're in charge of the whole thing. You work with the designers and the stress analysts to determine uh, what their purpose is in this test, what are they expecting out of it, uh, what kind of loads to apply, and you have to design the equipment to apply the loads, and there has to be some kind of a structure to support the test article, so you design that, and then you supervise the construction and the assembly, and you decide what instrumentation is going to be used. For six years? Yeah. Uh-huh. And then um, I read that you worked for a little while with um, Lear Jet, with Bill Lear. What was he like? <laughs> he was quite a character. Uh -huh.
So they didn't have they didn't have engineering degrees. That was Los Angeles? Yes. Uh -huh. They were located right at LAX. Mm -hmm. Those buildings are still there, I'm sure. Uh, as a structural test engineer. Mm -hmm. And now this was the real big time. They were working on the X-15. Mm -hmm. uh, ask you a question sure. uh, and this I think this ties in so you the, the autobiographical essay you sent to me that you wrote in 2013 you titled it adventures in aerospace or how I put my friend on the moon so right. so I think uh, if this kind of fits in mentioning the x-15 is that when you you know the connection to Neil Armstrong sort of comes up again or could you? We didn't talk. Uh, that's true because uh, he was one of the pilots that flew it. Uh, and there's a little story that goes with that. Uh, there's a little bit of a uh, reunion of some of us club members. Uh, one of my friends, Keith Smith, was uh, he was working for another division of North American, and he was. Involved in flight testing out of Edwards Air Force Base. 
So then... What I did on X-15, since it was rocket-powered, it had a, a series of high-pressure tanks in the propulsion system. Mm -hmm. So then um, you moved on to Space Technology Laboratories, STL? This is the B-70? One of them was destroyed in a mid-air collision. Uh, they, they, they wanted to get some photos of it in flight. And uh, they had a plane carrying the photographers in formation with it. And they wanted to move over to the other side of the B-70. And when they did that, they hit the vertical stabilizer of the B-70. Mm. And that was in the late 1950s? So like 50?
Yes. Oh, so that's TRW. Once you moved on to TRW, um, that's when you started working on the lunar module engine? So throttleable, so that it, uh, it can decrease or increase the velocity. Yeah, you can change the, uh, the thrust level of the 
attention oh. to how much force it produces. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask you about the uh, the schedule. Did you feel under pressure because of the the deadlines and? Yep, the end of the decade, or yeah. the end of the 60s. That's why we were working 24 hours a day. Wow.
Yeah. describe how how you um, how you watch did you watch the moon landing and how you did your crew did you all what what were you uh, feeling yeah. what were you feeling An 
abort. Yeah. Yeah, and you've heard what he said about that, that everybody knows that when the fuel gauge is on empty, there's usually one more drop, but I don't know. Great source of pride, though, when when he landed. And... Can you talk? Um, I read I meant in your um, biography or autobiography. You mentioned that those engines were also part of the Apollo thirteen mission. Oh, your 
kidding. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, that's quite a legacy for that engine design. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, Mr. Wells, we're kind of at it. We've been going for a little bit over an hour. Oh, my goodness. I know. Uh, an hour and six minutes. Um, well, I've got more to tell you if you want to schedule some more time. Yeah. Convenient. Yeah, well, that, that would be good. Why don't we do that? Uh, I'll tell you all about my space show experience. Oh, yes. All right, I'm making a note. I'll tell you what I can tell you, I should say. Okay, I understand. <laughs> well, let's do that then. Why don't we, uh, we'll close up this part one, and then okay. we'll uh, set up another time to, to talk soon. Whatever it's convenient for you, let me know. Okay, well, I just want to say... We'll work it out somehow. I want to say thank you so much for um, this time today. 